Um, our next and final presenter is Shane von Osterhout. He's a good, f yeah, he's a good friend of mine. He's a multi-talented. He's a writer. He is a uh, amateur horticulturist. He teaches digital media at Kendall College, and uh, he he works for, started a company called Media Beetle. They do social marketing. They worked on a lot of materials that you can see here at uh, Sanchez. So today he's going to talk about I think trees getting it on, which is really lady trees okay so one half of the equation but uh shane come on up here talk about lady trees so this i think this is really um exciting that we're ending the the three the sort of triad on environmental sciences because these are these are all things that i'm super passionate about okay How's that? Better? A better. Better? Okay. <clears throat> Go. Before 1950, most of the billions of trees that made up the United States urban forest were grown from seed. Each seed contained small genetic differences or variety within its DNA, allowing for diversity within the species. In other words, no two trees were genetically identical. A large number of the landscape trees we planted 60 years ago were dioecious, which means separate sex, so one male, one female. The ratio of male to female trees was about 50-50. So if you had taken a stroll in your pre-war neighborhood on a warm spring day in about 1949, the air was ripe with sex. Male trees were releasing their pollen by the tons, and either wind or pollinating insects such as uh, bees, flies, beetles, moths, and wasps were delivering the pollen to the abundant flowers blossoming on the branches of the female trees. So 1949 was a boom time for urbanization. Jobs were moving into the suburbs, new housing developments, business districts and shopping areas were springing up. Um, there was a huge need for landscape trees, new landscape trees all across America. At the same time, Dutch elm disease was literally decimating the American elm tree. It was once the most widely planted street tree across the United States. The American elm was nearing extinction. Billions of trees died. The USDA, foreseeing demand from professional landscapers and homeowners for new landscape trees, issued an official recommendation, wholesale and retail nurserymen ought to produce and sell only litter-free trees. But what does that mean, litter-free? It means that the tree does not produce fruit, seeds, or nuts. No messy things that will rain down on our perfect lawns or clog up our rain gutters or attract bees and wasps or birds that will eat the berries and poop on our cars. So in order for a tree to be litter-free, it must be a male tree. The origins of this male tree must not have involved the birds and the bees, and therefore no seed was ever produced, was ever planted. No seed was planted. This male tree can, have, can be only asexually propagated via state-of-the-art genetic engineering. But because of our prissiness, our insistence on having tidy, litter-free trees, female landscape trees have all but vanished. The ratio of female to male trees comprising the urban forest was once 50-50. Today, male trees are overwhelmingly out, outnumber female trees. And in many neighborhoods, there are virtually no female trees standing. So to better understand the history of, of modern plant propagation, we've got to look at the 1890s when food crops were being scaled up and mass produced by cutting, grafting, and layering techniques, all of which the, allow the grower to slice away or isolate a live section of the mother plant, then root the cutting, thus ensuring the plant's most desirable qualities are passed on. So late 19th century engineers, of course, furthered the future of industrialization of industrialized ag agriculture by building these huge steam-heated greenhouses and controlling the temperature and the moisture, nurserymen were able to meet market demands for large numbers of bare root or container-grown trees, and farmers can increase their yields and deliver products in shorter produce in shorter time. Of course, George Bernard Shaw, the great playwright, said, uh, "Science never solves a problem without creating ten more." And the problem with greenhouses is that they harbor uh, bacterium and fungi. In the Victorian age, they relied primarily on sulfur, lime, copper, and other heavy metals to mitigate the disease problems. But plant pathology was still a relatively new field of study. 
Uh, disease outbreaks in greenhouses were unpredictable, not well understood, and caused financial interruptions to the ag market. The 20th century gave us new fungicides, better sterilization methods, and the discovery of DNA. By the 1980s, we had discovered how, in a disease-free lab that's cleaner than a hospital operating room, to extract a single plant cell and then clone that cell over and over and over, producing the same male tree over and over millions and billions of times. This highly reliable method of asexual reproduction is called micropropagation, which is a form of genetic engineering. Today, America's many leafy streets, roads, and neighborhoods are referred to as pollen corridors due to the massive amounts of pollen generated by the abundance of the male trees. Even popular flowering trees, for example, crab apple, have been genetically engineered so as not to produce fruit. Without female trees and or viable flowers, there are no more sticky stigmas to trap and hold the so-called ambient pollen. But guess what else is moist and sticky? M mucosa of human eyes, nose, and mouth. And here's how our allergies work. Pollen, the antigens in the air reach the mucosa. They go into the bloodstream, taken up by cells in the immune system. Blah, blah, blah. Fast forward, histamine is released into the bloodstream. You have a reaction. So here's some data. In 1998 in Washington, D.C., tree pollen counts were 2,100 grains per cubic meter. By 2009, which was a peak year, pollen counts had doubled to 4,500 grains per cubic meter before returning to 1998 levels by 2009. In 2004, approximately 22 million persons, or 6.3% of the U.S. population, reported experiencing related symptoms, visiting a physician, or obtaining a prescription drug to treat allergic rhinitis. Medical spending to treat allergic rhinitis almost doubled from 6.1 billion in 2005 to 11.2 billion in 2005, in 2005 dollars. Um, the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America annually rates the top U.S. cities for spring allergies. Here are the top 10 for 2013. Jackson, Mississippi, Knoxville, Tennessee, Chattanooga, Tennessee, McAllen, Texas, Louisville, Kentucky, Wichita, Kansas, Dayton, Ohio, Memphis, Tennessee, Oklahoma City, Baton Rouge, Lenia, and Grand Rapids, where were we? Number 17 out of U.S. cities for the highest levels of spring pollen recorded. So, go out and plant a tree, and remember these three things. One, choose a species of tree that is native to the region because this improves genetic diversity. Two, make sure that the tree was grown sexually, so from seed. And three, plant a female tree. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. Get up for Shane one more time. Yes. I'm going to go plant a lady tree, and I mean that in the least sexual way possible. <laughs> <laughs>